Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Skills Workshop Virtual Career Fair. My name is Jamie Forbes. I'm a regional director in the Global Client Group at Dimensional Fund Advisors. And I'm joined by my colleagues tonight here in our studio that you'll be hearing from in just a minute. So if you haven't attended one of these sessions before, or as a reminder, these sessions are intended to bring you the skills, knowledge, and insight to help prepare you for a potential career in asset management. Over the months of September and October, you will have had the chance to hear from over 40 firms. Maybe last week you heard from Invesco, T. Rowe Price, and Alpha Real Capital, or maybe the pension fund um, schemes of my neighboring boroughs in London of Wandsworth and Richmond. So over the next hour, we hope to give you helpful perspectives about the different paths that each of us have taken in our journey in coming to work at Dimensional and the kind of work that we do with our clients in delivering on our collective mission to improve financial security for people. So over the, uh, we'll plan to leave about a half an hour at the end for questions. So please do send them through in the chat and we'll hopefully uh, be able to get to them. So our intention is that by the end of this session, you will hear something that resonates with your own career aspirations and some tips and perspective to help you be successful as you embark on your professional journey. So I'm gonna start by asking each of my colleagues here today, uh, if you can tell us in one sentence to briefly introduce yourself, what your role is at Dimensional and what your first job was. Kevin, can I start with you? Sure. Hi, my name is Kevin Hudson Phillips. I'm a regional director, manager, and vice president within the Global Client Group. Um, and my first ever job was as a waiter at Twickenham Stadium in the, in the boxes um, at the rugby games. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Archit Soni. I'm a fixed income portfolio manager uh, in the fixed income portfolio management team here at Dimensional. Uh, you might be able to tell from my accent, uh, I'm Australian and I've been here for about six years. My first job was uh, working at McDonald's, uh, you know, taking orders. It was right after high school. It was probably one of the toughest jobs I've ever had. I bet. <laughs> Hi, and I'm Tori Chip. Um, I'm a global recruitment manager here for Dimensional. My predominant focus is on hiring for the EMEA region, but also some senior global leadership positions across the states. Um, my first job was actually as a horse riding instructor. Fantastic. Well, my first job was in the secretary pool at the local nuclear power plant in the state of Washington, where I grew up. <laughs> so thanks very much for that, guys. Uh, just to kick us off briefly, I'm going to set the stage by um, starting with a high level overview of who Dimensional are, what sets us apart from other asset managers that you may have heard from, and the kind of work that we do with our clients. So stated simply, we're an asset manager. And we primarily manage assets on behalf of individuals who are saving for their retirement. Now, rather than work directly with these end investors, these individuals may be invested with Dimensional through a professional investor, maybe an independent financial advisor, a wealth manager, or a private banker, or maybe through the pension plan that their workplace sets up for them, or an, a government investing on behalf of its citizens, or as you might have heard last week, its public employees. Some other types of clients we might work with are, for example, nonprofit charities, foundations, or university endowments who want to keep their assets invested to provide for their future needs. So why would these investors choose to work with Dimensional instead of any other asset managers? We think there's really three reasons that set Dimensional apart. The first is that we take a different view of markets. On one hand, you might have passive managers that focus on matching the returns of a market as measured by an index, like the FTSE in the UK or the S&P 500 in the US. Passive investing or indexing is, is an increasingly popular way to invest as is both less expensive than active approaches. And it takes a lot of the guesswork out of what the investment outcome will be. You can pretty much get the market return. However, there are shortcomings in implementation as both what these passive managers can buy or sell and when is set by an inflexible index that at most only rebalances every quarter and a lot can happen in the markets over a quarter. So Dimensional is really seen to be a best of both as our daily process of trading and implementation allows us to improve upon passive, 
but without relying on trying to time or predict where the market is going. How do we do that? Well, that leads me to the second reason people might choose to work with Dimensional, which is that we have forged partnerships with leading academic researchers in financial science and now have over 40 years of experience in translating these insights into real world portfolios. These insights allow us to improve on indexing by emphasizing areas of the market or dimensions that are expected to have higher returns. So in equities, for example, that smaller companies tend to outperform larger companies or stocks with lower relative price, better value, uh, and companies that are more profitable tend to outperform. In bonds, a similar concept holds, but the insights are different. The crux of it is that investors should get compensated for taking on greater risk, whether that's holding bonds for a longer term or with a lower credit quality. And lastly, what sets Dimensional apart is our, how we service our clients. With our academic heritage, the education is at the heart of our client service model. We offer a wealth of conference opportunities and access to these academic thought leaders to help investors understand and gain confidence in what drives our investment approach and to be able to communicate that effectively to their clients. So it's really this client focus coupled with the honest and rigorous approach to research that fuels innovation at Dimensional. And just to give you a sense of the scale, we manage about $650 billion or almost 500 billion sterling globally. And you're seeing only a very small representation tonight of my 1400 colleagues uh, that we have across 13 offices globally. So I hope that helps to set the stage, but I know that probably like me, you're much more interested in hearing some of the personal experiences from my colleagues. So Kevin, I'm gonna start with you. Can you just give us a brief of your background and your career so far at Dimensional? Sure, and me and Arch had decided to do something a bit fun. And so we, we created a, a two minute me slide. So this slide that you're about to see kind of portrays the story of, of Kevin. So I'm originally from Trinidad in the Caribbean. So grew up there. What's Trinidad known for? It's known for its beaches, the steel, bat, steel drums, carnival, rum. But what's at the center of everything I do? And that's at the center of the screen and that's my family. So that's us at Christmas a couple of years ago. Um, with the, the latest news, I'm, I'm thrilled that I'll be able to get back to the Caribbean, get back to Trinidad at Christmas this time this year. But I came to, to the UK in 1998. So that's the same year that Dwight York signed for Manchester United. Um, so I've been in the UK, finishing my schooling and now living and working um, since, since 1998. You can see a map of the world there. Um, I feel like I'm well-traveled. Um, I've been lucky enough to travel to nearly 57 countries around the world. That picture in the top right is me in Spain. So I'm a, a registered celebrant. I was lucky enough to, to have the, the honor of marrying two of my best friends in, in Spain a couple of years ago. So I, I am available for yet another job if anyone should need. In, next there, you see I'm what you would call a, a spin enthusiast, if there's such a thing. Um, I've completed nearly 635 spin classes, so much so they felt obliged um, when rebranding last year to put a picture of me on their website. Sort of embarrassing. Um, but what are we here today? We're here really today to, to hear about my career, um, my journey through education, my journey throughout Dimensional. Um, so on the right there, you see I went to Queen Mary University in East London. I did my bachelor's in economics. I then completed a master's at Regent University. I've been at Dimensional 11 years now, and I've most recently started a part-time executive MBA at the University of Chicago Booth Business School. But the remit today was to really to give you a, a taste of my journey. Um, so in order to do that, I decided to write a story. And the story really is there to highlight that perhaps one should realize that the major anti antagonist to sometimes one career and someone's journey um, is oneself. But I also wanted to highlight the importance of having a great manager, mentor, and coach throughout your career who you can ask for help for, because asking for help is, is still very key. So my story begins in a noisy London coffee shop, and I'm sitting there waiting for an ex-boss and now friend to arrive. Let's call him James for the sake of this story. And in, in, in that moment, for reasons I don't quite remember, I began to reflect on the personal journey I'd had throughout my career. I was an island boy from the Caribbean who just successfully hit his 10-year-long anniversary 
at a globally renowned asset management company called Dimensional Fund Advisors. Now, as I saw James arriving, in a flash, I recalled the pivotal role he played in my career and the example he set on how to be a great leader and mentor. Now, as I said, I did my undergrad at Queen Mary in economics, but I ended up graduating with only a 2-2, probably due to a lack of maturity and probably discipline during my undergraduate studies. Not the grade one would want entering into the, the job market, especially if you're looking for a job in financial services. But with a newfound purpose and mentality, I was able to go back and do my master's and, and, and get a, a, a decent degree. But after graduating in 2009, I was able to, to, to secure a job as a trading system at a multi-strategy hedge fund. Now that role provided all the great promise and opportunity that one would want to build a career in finance, but things didn't always didn't work out. You know, and my time at that hedge fund would be very much short-lived. As the lingering effects of the global financial crisis hit, I found myself out of work in the summer of 2010 with a newfound respect for the, the financial services industry. Now, my first role at Dimensional was meant to be temporary. It was a three-month-long contract where I was brought in to help on a data and investment writing um, sort of rotation um, within the global crime group, or then the institutional sales group. And James was the head of the team at the time. And I remember that first interview perfectly well. He said to me, Kevin, given that I'm sitting opposite you here today means you already have the job. That means the team must see something in you. So now that that's out of the way, what do you want for your career? What could I do to help? Well, I left James's office with a, with a job and a promise from him that if I worked hard and had the right attitude, he would help me find that next step in my career. Now, it's clear for my tenure at the firm that that three-month-long project soon turned into, well, very much turned into a 10-plus year career. Now, throughout my years at Dimensional, I was pushed and challenged. It wasn't smooth sailing. But having leaders I could look up to do kept me on track. I often, I fondly became known as the Swiss Army knife of the team, as my, my contributions were wide spanning across various different client types across all of Europe, Middle East, and Africa. But in July 2018, after a sudden set of departures, I was given responsibility of our Nordic book of business. I was finally given the clear remit that I wanted. It was a vast step up but a challenge that I very much felt prepared to take on. And the next year was extremely rewarding. I was given autonomy. I was able to exceed my activities and meeting targets. I had high client retention. I had a strong opportunity pipeline against me. I was so very proud of my efforts and what I'd done today. And it was a Thursday morning when the newly appointed co-CEO of the Dimensional London office called me, called me into his office to discuss the year just gone past. He congratulated me on my results and effort he thanked me for again being that trusted pair of hands that the firm could rely upon. But he then proceeded to offer me a role where I would reduce my client exposure, but instead take on management of some of the junior sales support team. Now, while the offer was meant to be positive, I couldn't see it at the time. Sitting in his fishbowl of an office, I knew my colleagues around us couldn't hear our conversation, but I felt that all eyes were on me. I'd never thought of myself as having leadership or management qualities. At that stage, I thought my career persona was meant to be of that sales and client guy on the road speaking with clients. I'd proven I could be a salesperson. So why would the firm want to reduce my exposure to this revenue generating part of the business? I walked out of his office feeling deflated, that the efforts of the past year had gone unnoticed. All that I was so very proud of would, had been unappreciated. And as I continued to dwell on the situation, the more and more I felt like an imposter. I began doubting my own abilities. I hastily considered my options, started thinking about, is my CV up to date? What recruiters do I have on the phone? As I scrolled through my contact list, I came across James's contact information. And in that moment, I remembered our first ever interview where he offered me help. I dialed his number and he answered on the third ring. Now I took that new role at Dimensional and it today has me in a position where I'm nurturing the firm's future talent while also in tandem having the responsibility of delivering sales results and managing client relationships. James's mentorship and advice were one of the main reasons for me taking the role, knowing that at the very least, I'd be able to share the learnings and teachings of my own experiences with my more junior team members. 
the past three years has now allowed me to have a true appreciation for the help and opportunity that I've been given throughout my career. And most importantly, make that realizing that making yourself available to others can have extremely significant impact. The dual role has brought me more personal pride and success than I could have ever imagined. And now sitting, sitting, sitting opposite James in this coffee shop as more than just former colleagues, I sit in a position of being able to navigate my firm, deliver sales results, yet most importantly, keep people at the center of everything I do. Now that's my story, and I hope there's some key takeaways you can, and learnings you can take from that. Um, thank you all for listening. Well, that's fantastic, Kevin. I think um, I'm sure that many can relate to that imposter syndrome you describe. Um, I know I've been there and I can personally relate to that Swiss army knife as well. Uh, it's got some upsides of flexibility, but maybe that downside you described <laughs> of the, the lack of accountability, but a great case study of how to really effectively seek out and make the most of the mentorship relationships along the way. Um, appreciate that. Archit. How about you? What can you tell us about your journey in coming to Dimensional and um, how your career has evolved? Good evening, everyone. Um, very similar to, to Kevin. I, I put together a slide with some embarrassing photos about myself and, and, and my past. Um, just to start it off, I, I was born in India, Punjab, uh, north of India, and, and my parents uh, migrated to Australia um, in the early 90s. Uh, Australia is a great island state. Uh, uh, in you know towards the area known as the down under it's kind of in the southern hemisphere far away from everything uh, one of the things it's famous for is sport uh, barbecues and traveling um, the, the vast land that it is and one of the things for me growing up was watching uh, watching cricket a lot you know India versus Australia was a sporting event that I'd always go to the boxing day test match um, and uh, at the uh, you know at the center of all of this was, was my family as well so having moved to the UK about seven years ago now, one of the things I like to keep doing is that I do fly my parents over from Australia and we go traveling quite a bit. Um, the photo that you see there at the bottom is um, when me and my parents, we went to Iceland uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there's a big fountain, uh, sorry, waterfall in the back there you can see. Um, and it's been a great experience, um, you know, traveling Europe. But, you know, why we're here today is about uh, the journey of how I reached Dimensional. You can see that... Um, my uh, alma mater, I, I studied at Macquarie University um, and very much like Kevin, I'm now starting my executive MBA um, ha about halfway through it. Um, and uh, having worked here at Dimensional for six years, my journey's similar, but also different to, to uh, Kevin and how we, how we got here to the position we're in. Um, so if I set the scene and I take you back on my journey, I hope you learned some of the, the key things that I were, you know, was I able to take from the different experiences that I had. Uh, we go back to 2009. Uh, I just finished my undergraduate degree from Macquarie University, where I focused in applied finance and, and economics, majoring in actuarial science and statistics, very mathematical based degree. And I was looking to get into funds management. I always liked investing in the stock market and the macro factors and the fixed income market. So I was always someone who was interested in financial markets. So I, I started applying for graduate roles. Um, you know, I'd always been a strong, can, uh, strong student. I'd always done well at university. However, 2009 and 2010 was a very interesting time. A lot of, a lot of financial uh, trading desks had cut down their operations. A lot of companies had lost money. They had shrunk their, their graduate pool. So one of the things and constant feedbacks I got when I was applying was, Archie, you don't have enough experience um, for the role or in the sense that the competition that I was up against had a lot more experience than me. So I was finding it very difficult and I was frustrated. Uh, I took some advice from a couple of my friends and they said, look, Archie, if you can't get into the role that you want, why don't you try and get into the company that you want in a different role and then move around? And so I did that. I, I applied for uh, some other uh, graduate roles and I got into Macquarie Bank's uh, graduate rotation within their operations department within Macquarie Funds Group. So I'd be working really close to the, the traders and the portfolio managers, but I was focusing on other areas. So that would be things like fund accounting, trade support, operations, settlements. Um, and so those things gave me a really good idea of, of, of the functioning back office and middle office operations but it was still away from what I really wanted to do. Um, and so about a year into the role, I got a really interesting opportunity. Macquarie was holding a, a company-wide poker tournament. It was a charity tournament. 
Uh, and I, like I said, in my undergraduate degree, I'd, I'd studied statistics. So I loved playing poker as a part of our curriculum, um, learning about probability and statistics. So I, I joined the poker tournament and, you know, it was actually a really good networking event because I sat across tables from a lot of other people at the firm, a lot of senior members, as well as some of those people in those teams that I wanted to join. Um, so, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't make this up, but I was sitting on the final table uh, across the table from me was the head of portfolio management for one of the teams that I wanted to work in. Um, I ended up having, uh, you know, really good cards and, and invertedly I had pocket aces and <laughs> I won the tournament and I left the name, you know, I, I guess an impression on the head of trading. Um, so he, he, you know, he gave me his card and he said, look, let's catch up next week. Um, because I told him, you know, throughout the night that I'd been working in this particular part of the business and I was looking to, to move towards an area very similar to an area that he was in. So, you know, I was very excited. I'd, I'd created an opportunity out of thin air, really. Um, uh, the, you know, the job got posted. I put in my application. I went through the interviews. Um, and a couple of, you know, uh, rounds into the interview, I got, I got some feedback from the hiring manager. He called me and he said, look, Archie, you're, you're a very strong candidate. You know, um, a lot of people have said very positive things about you. How, unfortunately, you know, the pool of applicants that are applying, there's some really strong applicants out there. Some who had three or four years of direct experience. And my last two years of experience was not not in, in trading or portfolio management. I'd been working in operations, doing fund accounting and a few other various tasks. So that was very deflating for me because um, I had, you know, the original reason I'd gone into the role was thinking that maybe I'd be able to move into that role mm -hmm. because of the relationships I'd built. Uh, but that was around that time when I realized that because we were doing these operational roles, we had also built relationships with fund managers outside the business because Macquarie did the same job for other fund managers. And I'd built a really strong relationship with um, a chap named Matthew Drennan. He was the chief investment officer at a business called Mosaic Portfolio Advisors. It was a multi-asset fixed income and equities manager where they managed some money in-house and some money externally through managers. I leveraged that relationship and decided to leave Macquarie Bank. Um, and this was when actually a, a very key thing happened in my life. And this is one of the things that I want you to take away from this as well, is that through Matthew, it wasn't as much the role, but the mentorship that I gained. Because over the next two years, one of the key things that Matthew did for me was that he actually pushed me to learn more and also go into the deep end. Um, for example, I used to create economic presentations for him to present to clients. About six or seven months into the role, he said, Archer, look, I think you're very confident. I want you to go and do the next presentation. So that was me going into the deep end I'd never presented before. But that mentor relationship was, you know, there was someone in my, uh, in my midst who wanted me to succeed. So how did I get to dimensional from there? Well, you know, I, I'd been in uh, the industry now for about five years and I'd got into a position where the company was actually being taken over. So my boss or Matthew um, at the time said, look, Archon, maybe it's, in, it's important that you start thinking about where you wanna be in four or five years time. And he was the one that said to me, maybe you should look at going overseas to the UK. And one of the things that he did for me was uh, we had, like I said to you, Mosaic Portfolio Advisors had relationships with some external managers. So I actually, he decided that I'd go and sit on some of the desks of these financial other um, fund managers. One was Dimensional, one was T. Rowe Price, another one was PIMCO. You know, these were large asset managers that I, I could go and see how they invested and build some relationships with them. Anyways, uh, it would get to, to, towards the end of my time there. I'm flying to the UK. I've saved up a bunch of money. I've got four or five years of experience. Uh, and I come to this new country um, and I start applying for, uh, for new jobs. And it was very difficult because now actually I had a different obstacle. It wasn't my marks and it wasn't my work experience. It was my visa. You know, I, I was a foreigner in a country that was fighting against people that had working rights to work here. Whereas I, I was here on a two year work visa. Um, so I go through a lot of applications and I actually started getting offers for roles that I actually didn't want. So it was in, you know, those same type of operational roles. And I was like, I'd already done that route. I only want to go and try and focus on the role that I want. So go figure a role comes up at Dimensional Fund Advisors for a fixed income trader. Uh, and that's when the, you know, I get alarm bells in my head thinking I have built relationships there. Um, I'm going to apply for the role. And this is the other thing that I recommend you do. After I applied for the role, I sent in my CV. The next day I actually called through and spoke with the HR person just to put my, myself in front of them because you know human resources they're getting thousands and thousands of CVs.
But if you ring them up and speak to them, they might look at yours instead of all the, the 600 they have to go through. It's just something that I did. I don't, you know, depending on the type of person you are, if you're forward, you might be able to put yourself in front of them. But, you know, going on from that, I'd given myself the best opportunity to land an interview. And that's all I could do. That relationship that I'd built um, on that trading desk in Sydney allowed me to secure an interview. And it was a very rigorous process. I had over 12 interviews with everyone at the firm, right? <laughs> I ended up meeting so many, so many people. But, uh, you know, I think the strong relationships I'd built, the strong candidate that I was, and of course, I'd done my research about the business. Mm. So at the end, I ended up securing the role and I've been here for six years. I'm more of a senior person in the team. And since then, I've hired five, you know, four or five new people. One of the key things I look for is that proactive nature. Um, mm. What have they done outside work? What are the relationships they've built? Um, so I think the key takeaways that I would give is have that mentor in your life and be very proactive in the way you look for work. I really appreciate that, Archit. I think it's especially um, useful to hear how you navigated setbacks and really kept that positive growth mindset and not willing to kind of settle on the first maybe opportunity because that wasn't where you, you wanted to take your career. And I guess similar to, to Kevin had some great mentors to, to help you along the way. Appreciate that. Tori, I think um, you are the person everyone is going to want to hear especially more from um, as you're obviously the first person that people come across when applying for a job here. So maybe could you just kick us off by what are some of the types of early career roles uh, that you typically recruit for and what are the, I guess, most important things, whether it's the skills or experiences um, or uh, education that you're looking for when you're screening candidates? Yeah, so as part of being a global company, I guess sometimes people might think that the London office would be a much smaller part of a business, which maybe is only a sales focus or just a legal focus or compliance. Um, we're quite lucky here at Dimensional in that, yes, we are part of a much broader global organization, but the London office in particular, which is where we're all set from, does have every function that you would expect to any normal asset manager from trading to sales, to legal, like I say, HR, marketing, the works. So we do tend to recruit entry-level roles across the full breadth of the organization here. Um, some are less frequent than others just due to the size of the teams. So the roles that you'll see come up most frequently will be called an analyst or an associate, depending on what part of the business it is. If you're an entry-level person, I would say those are the roles that you really should be keeping an eye out for. Where you're going to see them come up most frequently are going to be in our two biggest groups. So the global client group, which is what Kevin is a part of, and then also portfolio management, which is where Archit now sits. Now, you may think that we look for really specific things for each of those different types of positions, but truth be told is that we don't. Um, we try and look for attitude where possible. So if people have reached out to us proactively, um, we look for people that have performed well, typically at university or at school. Um, it's just a good differentiator. If that isn't the case for you, do reach out and let us know maybe if there was extenuating circumstances or if, you know, if actually you just like, like Kevin weren't maybe that applied during your undergrad. Um, we're keen still to hear from you because I think that tenacity goes a long way to showing, you know, why you want to work at Dimensional. But fundamentally, the thing is above everything, and I think my biggest frustration sometimes with recruitment is the applications that we don't see. Mm. Um, so what I would say is it's always worth a go, um, especially when you're coming into this with little to no experience. We don't expect the world, so don't think we do. Um, and we're more than happy usually to have a conversation as well. So it's about getting your application in as much as it is about kind of tailoring it. Oh, I think that's really useful. Um, and you obviously uh, see lots of CVs, <laughs> probably thousands. Um, what are maybe some of the pet peeves that you might, uh, I guess, advise against um, that uh, cause you to maybe dismiss candidates more so? Yeah, so the number one on that list is always people that have done a really tailored CV for a particular interview process or for a particular role or a particular company. And then they've sent that CV to my role and it's something completely different. So I think Kevin will, will vouch for this quite frequently. We see people that, you know, they want to work in a really, you know, trading focused position applying for a sales role um, and it whilst it's difficult to overcome it's not impossible but what I would say is just these are really simple things that you can you know 
double and triple check, make sure your CV is relevant to the role that you're applying for. Or if you don't know and you're applying for, you know, there's, there's broad positions out there like a, an internship, keep it generic. Don't be too specific because you almost don't want to play your card too soon. Um, the other thing I would say, and it's just things that are really easy to correct, um, make sure your contact information is up to date and is relevant. We, we do see people that we can't get hold of on the phone sometimes because there's a digit missing. Um, and the other part then is just typos. It sounds really dumb, but unfortunately, if you're competing against hundreds of other applicants, just try and erase them from your CV. Have someone triple check it for you, maybe an old lecturer or just your friends. Just get someone to put that third eye over it to make sure it's as good as it can be. Yeah, that's a, that's um, a great tip. Um, is there any, I guess, recommendations or requirements that we have about cover letters? So I'm personally not a fan of cover letters. Um, reason for it is, especially at the entry level type positions that we're looking for, there are a lot of time for something that not everyone's going to read. So cover letters tend to be really valuable to hiring managers. Whether they get in front of a hiring manager or not is sometimes dubious because they might not be as tailored or as specific as they could be. What we tend to do actually early stages in our interview process is invite candidates to perform more of a written assessment. So these can be on three really basic questions such as, you know, why dimensional or why do you want to work in this particular area? That tends to be so much more relevant, so much more pertinent to the hiring manager, but also really allows you to prep well for an interview process. So for me, I would say focus on getting your CV right. If an application requires a cover letter, keep it brief, keep it specific to the role in the company, and basically just put something in there because it's definitely not gonna make or break your application. Yeah, um, and you mentioned one key question you would want candidates to be able to um, answer is why dimensional? Are there maybe any other kind of key questions that you're screening for or that people ought to think about having prepared for before coming to speak to us? Yeah, so I think knowing the company is really important. You are, again, we say this, you know, it's a vanity project sometimes, but we like to know that you want to work for us. So when I ask why dimensional, it's always nice not to hear quotes back of, well, you're a global firm, these are, this is your AUM, but maybe hearing something a bit more pertinent to, well, actually I watched these videos on your website and they really appeal to me because I've been in that position. So personalize it. The other aspect would be, why do you want that specific role? Prepare yourself for each specific interview. And what I mean by that is you don't have to know the role inside out because this is still an entry level position, but know why you want to perform that role. Know what skills you may have acquired throughout school, throughout university, throughout internships, work experience that will make you a really good solid hire for this position. So that can be teamwork, that can be collaboration, that can be salesmanship, that could be analytical skills. But dig down into that job description, because fundamentally, as hiring managers like Archer and Kevin and as a recruitment professional like myself, those job descriptions really do tell you a lot about what you need to know. And so if you dig down into what we're actually saying there, we're almost giving you the answers to kind of ace our questionnaires as you go through. So be super familiar with it. Know exactly what the interview is for. You would be surprised the amount of times I've interviewed people that have thought they're applying for something else. Um, and midway through the interview, kind of got a shock why I'm asking them why they want to work in sales versus portfolio management. So just be as prepared as you can be for that individual interview. If you've made it to interview stage, you're likely in the top 10% of applicants at a minimum. So take pride in that and really put your best foot forward. That's some, some great uh, advice, Tori. Thank you. And we've obviously heard from both Kevin and Archard about the role that mentors have had in helping them navigate their careers. Um, what other advice might you have, Tori, for people starting their careers in asset management, um, especially those that might not know exactly what they want to do? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, I don't think anybody here is gonna lie to you and say it's easy. You've heard from two people already that have, you know, had their knockbacks and maybe not got the original job that they wanted. However, reach out to people. I think the consistent message we're hearing here is, ways to make yourself stand out. And it's by really demonstrating that you want that job. The way you go above and beyond in wanting that job is reaching out to the people on the team, maybe some ex-alumni from your school, maybe someone that, you know, 
you know, nepotism doesn't always work in an interview process, but if you know somebody that knows somebody, speak to them about what the role is. And it maybe just gives you that little bit more insight into that role. But fundamentally, you do need to ask for their help. You need to ask for their advice and you need to ask for their time. So make sure you go knowing what you want from them, because that is going to be the first impression that you make. And, you know, as soon as you say to me, oh, I actually spoke to X in your, I know your trading team. The likelihood is I'm going to pick up the phone to X and see what they think. So treat all of those conversations like an interview, but don't be afraid to ask for follow-ups and for more, because ultimately, if those people are going to answer your questions from day one, they're more than likely going to be prepared to kind of help you along the way as well, because we've all been there ourselves. So as kind of the typical gatekeeper, I suppose, story <laughs> yeah. of, of a lot of people coming in, I suppose, um, what's your sort of preference for how candidates, whether they're early in their career or maybe uh, more experienced, we, we obviously get a lot of um, people applying from maybe more of the academia side of things after they've maybe done their PhDs or something. Who would you recommend or how are they um, maybe best able to um, reach out to, to the firm? Is that you, LinkedIn? Yeah, so there's lots of different avenues and it really does depend on where you're coming from and what advice you're looking for. So if you're coming down the PhD route, I'd definitely say maybe look for other people with PhDs in the organization because they're going to tell you a lot more than I could probably tell you. Um, if you're coming down the standard kind of entry level route, what I would say is a connection request on LinkedIn goes a long way. It just is that other little flag there that's like, actually, that person's clearly gone a little bit more out of their way to try and find me and know a bit more about me so then they can have a more productive conversation with me. I don't think we need essays. I don't think, um, you know, there needs to be a phone call every hour to check on the status of your application. But a degree of following up is certainly relevant, especially in like the sales roles, because they're the sorts of behaviors that we look for. For the more high volume roles, which do tend to be the kind of trading analyst, portfolio management analyst roles, it can be a bit of a patience game. So it's really about treading that fine balance whereby you make sure that your resume and that your application is being viewed, but not to the point where you wouldn't want to sit next to that person maybe for the next two years of your career. Um, so I think, yeah, it's about treading that fine balance, but hopefully you should see that, you know, in the way that they respond to you as well. If that opens further conversation, keep pushing. If not, maybe just kind of hang tight. There's, there's a lot going on as well. Yeah. And, you know, Kevin is somebody who, um, as you mentioned, has spent uh, a few years more recently having more junior members of your team. Mm -hmm. And um, you kind of now get to pay it forward a bit in terms of your mentoring. Um, maybe what is uh, some advice that you might offer to uh, people early in their careers about that? You know, I don't know exactly what I want to do. Um, how would you approach that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a really good question, Jamie. I think I think the thing I'd, I'd, I'd highlight is that it's perfectly okay that you don't know what you want to do. When I think about the first years of someone's career, it really should be actually about crossing things off the list that you don't want to do. You know, you in, that, in those first couple of years of your career, just like Archard was saying in his story, he kind of identified that, you know, the back office, middle office operation side of things was not what he wanted to do. The roles across the financial services industry is so wide and vast it's okay that you don't, when you graduate, you don't perfectly know your, your journey. Cause I think you have to embrace the, the unknown. And I think that's hopefully what you got a little bit from Archard and my story is that there are many un unknowns that are gonna come to you in your career, many crossroads and making those decisions here and there and asking for help, I think will put you in a better stead overall. Hmm. Archit, what about you? I, I appreciated your story of your mentor and um, you mentioned, you know, you're kind of, also in a position where you're hiring more people yourself. Is there any advice that you might give to people in how they would either seek out or look to nurture those mentoring relationships? Um, yeah, sure. I think one of the key things I speak with, um, you know, I've spoken to some of the members in my team now and, and then people that apply that don't get roles as well. And I give them advice about going to the future. Um, I always say like, think about who you want to be maybe in four to five years time. You, you might not have a great idea, but a rough idea about where, which, which way you want to journey towards. And, you know, I go back to 2008, 2009, and the world was very different. Mm -hmm. Now you've got social media in all aspects. So you've got LinkedIn, which is such a great, great avenue. 
for you to look at people that maybe I want to follow this person's footsteps. And all you will need to do is just contact them and ask them, what was it like? How did they get there? What were some of the hurdles? Uh, and you never know who might answer those questions for you. Because I think, you know, one way, like um, what Kevin was saying, you'll figure out some things that you don't want to do through those conversations. And you never know, you might find that mentor. So I think, you know, figuring out where you want to go and then asking questions, being very proactive, LinkedIn allows you to do that now. And you never know who would be there to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what, what stands out to you or is impressive to you with people? I mean, do you ever turn down requests for people asking for information or anything? What, what makes you want to um, entertain those conversations? No, I, I, I've actually, I've had a number of um, messages in the past and I, I've, you know, definitely had conversations with people, but it is something to, to think about, like, um, you know, one of the key things I would do is uh, before I prepared for an interview is I would look at the person that I'm, that was going to interview me and look at some of their habits. Like, did they like playing tennis or did they like a particular sport? What was the things that they had worked in? So you could actually ask questions that were related to them, get to know them as a person. You know, you can't just uh, assume that that person's going to think the way you think. And that's, I think, one of the growing things about building relationships. You need to get to know the person. So asking questions that show that you have a bit more interest in the area that they're in. So if the person, you know, I've had some people um, saying that they've got uh, PhDs. So speaking to some of the people in our firm that have PhDs, you might be able to connect on a different level to say someone else in the sales team. Mm. Yeah. Kevin, how about you? Um, in terms of how to connect with what with people, yeah, or or what kind of tips would you give for people who kind of think, why would somebody want to maybe even have an informational interview with me, or um, do they even want to spend time with me? What kind of stands out if they uh, do that well? I think it's as as Archer said, you know, you want to make it a two way street. So when I think of the the men the mentees that I have and the, and the work I do as a mentor now and being able to, as you said, Jamie, pay it back. I think it's those who come with proactivity. So they're coming with an agenda at every meeting that we're, or connection that we're having. You know, they're, they're, they're being appreciative of my time, um, knowing that obviously I have many other responsibilities of the day-to-day -day, as well as obviously a personal life. So when they're, they're using, when they're spending time with me, they're making that time as useful as possible. And that, that time is as useful as possible by them driving the agenda. Because therefore, I know how to therefore interact with them. You know, it's 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 more frustrating rather than not when when you when you do connect with someone and you're you're giving them your time, but then they're expecting you to kind of take them through mm. this conversation. So that's all I can encourage is that being proactive with your 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 network building, being proactive with how you work and and interact with a with a mentor or someone you don't know or thinking about your career. I think puts you in a very strong stead and and will distinguish you from others. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I know for myself, I've had people reach out to me, whether it's through, you know, a network or um, family friends or friends of friends and, and ask for just an informational interview, um, regardless of whether I'm in a position to hire or, or have a role, um, but very much just open to kind of having that, um, that conversations, particularly if there are specific questions, they've done their homework, they know sort of what your background is and how it ties to what, um, what they're interested in speaking about. And then just being very maybe respectful of that, of that time goes a long way, doesn't it? Um, we've had another question come in, really appreciate the questions from our audience, um, just about, I'm gonna ask uh, Tori to uh, speak to this one about just elaborating on the details of our recruitment process. I mean, what's kind of, we're all here in person today. Um, we're not doing a lot of that these days, but it's nice when we can. Uh, are we doing a lot of Zoom, um, still virtual, or how much is that relative to in-person? How, how have you managed that? So traditionally, we would typically conduct kind of a telephone interview and a Zoom screen before doing a more kind of major panel-based interview in person in the office. Um, with COVID, that has somewhat gone out the window and everything for, well, for the last 18 months has been purely on Zoom. Um, it's been weird somewhat and slightly, um, slightly refreshing to come into the office and see people not on the screen for the last few weeks. Um, I am confident kind of as of the new year coming in that we will start to return to more in-person interviews. 
Um, but as it stands, we are still focusing on Zoom. I think we're, you know, we're a privately owned firm. We're still relatively conservative in, in how we're approaching this pandemic. And therefore, our first obligation, unfortunately, at the moment for, for external applicants is to ensure that our employees and our colleagues feel safe in the offices. And as we're kind of drip feeding back to normality, that's our primary objective at the moment. But kind of that being said, I think going into next year, um, we will very much be focused on getting the interview process back up and in person. So you can see our pretty cool offices. Yeah, it's exciting. And this fantastic studio, we talked about kind of the focus on our, our client service and being able to, to deliver that. Um, well, I wanted to maybe provide each of you with an opportunity to offer any you know, final takeaways um, for our audience tonight. Sure, I can go. Um, I think it's, it's, it's all about us, I think, not to repeat Arch again, but, but setting goals and setting high goals, but make sure they're not unattainable. Because I think what one will realize in, in life is that if you set unattainable goals, they, you, you often get referred to as a charlatan and you very much will soon be recognized as one. So set high goals, have a clear path and, and plan of how you want to achieve them, and, but have a little bit of fun along the way. You know, it's a, a fable or story my father would often tell me is, you know, it's not the story, the tortoise or the hare, because the tortoise didn't have any fun. So it's really <laughs> about being both the tortoise and the hare uh, and, and having a bit of fun in your career along the way. Excellent. Artit, do you have any? Um, any final pieces of advice? I think uh, kind of going back to what Tori said, I think one of the things that made me stand out during the interview process was I really researched the firm. Um, one of the things we, we do as a firm is if you go on our website, uh, we're very transparent and open in, in what we do, how we invest. So when you come into the interview process and think about, you know, uh, dimensional as a company and why you're applying to it, knowing about the firm's history and philosophy, there's so much information out there. Do your research. So besides being all that proactiveness, if you do your research, you'll really stand out because when they sit across from you, it would almost feel like you're already someone who works here. Um, I think that's probably one of the more important things that I, I mean, especially when it comes to the interviews that I've done and the candidates that I've met. That's really helpful. Um, it does look like we've got a couple of different ways that um, our viewers are able to ask us some questions. So I am just trying to pull up. I think there's a good one here. If yeah. It's helpful for Can you to, read it? to go to. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, one of the questions that I've seen come in so far has been around, you know, what population of our graduate roles are filled by those that have done summer internships with us. And the truth is, um, we've not had summer interns in the London office for a couple of years now, and we've still been hiring graduate, uh, graduate roles. So definitely apply. Um, the other part of that is that even when we have internships, we're only doing a couple. So maybe two to five internships in this office we will be hiring routinely more than those those couple of people so yes apply for the internships if that's what you're looking for it's it's basically a great 10 week intern like interview with us um and aside from that continue to apply for for the other roles um as mentioned earlier it's kind of around the associate and analyst title that you really want to be focusing on um i did see another question pop up here around whether we would prefer to review somebody's uh, resume with a master's or a CFA child holder or, you know, more mm -hmm. financial specialist uh, kind of qualifications. And the truth is both. Um, we rate people highly that want to continue with their, you know, flexing their academic muscles. I mean, look at these two kind of already <laughs> kind of going through the executive MBA and continuing to push themselves whilst in full-time employment. So I would say, pick what suits you best. You know, the master's degree is much more traditional academia. And if you suit the kind of exams being, you know, in a more full-time program, then that's going to definitely be something that suits you. However, if you kind of want to learn on the go, maybe the CFA would be something that, that would be suitable. And I think you'll typically find as well that a lot of firms will help support you through that as well, because it's something that we love to see people continuing to do. So speaking from a dimensional perspective, we would definitely kind of assist and help you through that if that was something you kind of raised your hand and said, yep, 
that's yeah. that's for me. Actually, I mean, great point, Kevin. How any advice? Um, have you balanced working and, and studying for the CFA and and now the yeah MBA? I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I highlighted, you know, that I didn't get the best grades at, at, you know, at university. I didn't get the best grades at high school. But I, I think as I matured, I was able to, to find my sort of that sweet spot of how I can study. And I think it was when I realized the purpose of what I was studying. So me taking on the CFA during my early stages of career dimension was really about, to me, showing a commitment to the industry. And I think that's what the CFA provides. Um, being on the sales side, I, there was no requirement for me to do to get become a CFA charter holder, but it was something that I wanted to develop because I wanted to to understand the world outside of just dimensional and be able to have really meaningful, um, deep level conversations with my clients. So it's about that balancing competing premiums, balancing balancing a day, and being dedicated to to what you want to achieve. Great. Um, Archie, I've got a question for you, I think. Um, so we've, we've had uh, somebody in the audience that has maybe a little bit more experience um, working in, in fixed income and um, now uh, more recently in, in ESG and, and sustainability, something that I know uh, you have some experience with. Uh, is there any, um, I guess, kind of light you can shed on our investment philosophy um, in fixed income with sustainability, given the, the time that we have. I know you could go a long, <laughs> yeah, a long yeah. way, uh, but, and then, you know, from a perspective of somebody that might be coming in with more experience um, than the entry level we talked about, is there any advice that you would give there? Yeah, no, sure. Um, look, ESG is a, it's, it's a growing market. So doing the research in that is, is very important. I think most businesses are starting to realize that that's become, you know, uh, uh, the wants and needs of a lot of clients out there. Now, if, if I go back to the idea of the investment philosophy, you kind of touched on it in the beginning. Um, Dimensional has been a systematic, you know, transpa transparent, process-driven investment manager for over 40 years. Within fixed income, the way we invest is very similar to the way we invest in equities in the sense that we start with the premise that the price, uh, it does a really good job of incorporating all available information into it. And those are things such as future expectations of risk, future expectations of return. And so what we do is we use price as our fundamental building block to decide, okay, how do we want to structure portfolios? But we start with the premise that, that, the, that the security price is fair. But just because if the security price is fair, and let's say I have two securities, security A and security B, they don't necessarily have the same expected return whether it's fixed income, whether it's equities. So determining based on a number of different dimensions of expected return that we have, we can come up with a portfolio that tries to outperform holding the market to go towards those securities that have higher expected returns. And so that's what I'd think about. Our investment philosophy's cornerstone is built on that idea that the price is a good starting point. Securities have, you know, if securities are fairly priced, that doesn't mean they have the same expected return. And then that last pillar of our philosophy is that you can have great ideas, you know, you can have great portfolios, but being able to capture it in a cost-effective way. Implementation is what counts. And so for us, you know, we've been investing systematically for close to 40 years, about the same time in fixed income as we've been doing in equities. I think that's the cornerstone of the way we invest. And if we think about ESG, it's the same thing. So it kind of builds on the same idea. You know, it's all based on data that we have. And at the end of the day, we want to use as much robust, transparent data as we can. And right now, if you look at it, there's so many different rating agencies. There's so many different scales. The way companies are analyzed, whether it has a high or low ESG rating, varies out there from different, different types of you know, market participants, where you've got those large rating agencies or you've got those large traditional uh, evaluators of ESG. So what do we do? Well, some of the key things we look at is what is the, the at the fundamental level, what is some of the raw data that we can use to come up with a way that we can be very systematic and transparent? So one of the key things we look at is the carbon intensity of particular companies. And that's actually very transparent data. You can go and have a look at what is the actual carbon footprint of a business. And we can implement that into some of our portfolios. So I think just at a very high level, the way we think about ESG is that, look, it's a very new industry in terms of the data that's out there. A lot of the data that's coming out is maybe 15, 20 years old. And as that industry grows and the data becomes more robust, 
one thing that Dimensional is very good at is using data. We've been using different forms of data in our investment and portfolio process for a long time. And as new data comes in, we keep incorporating that into our process. You'll see that in our investment portfolios. You know, they've evolved over 40 years and they're just slowly incrementally improving. And it's the same thing with ESG. It's just that additional form of incremental improvement from the point of view of a client. Um, I hope that kind of gives you a rough idea, um, but that's kind of how we think about it. No, that's great. As, as we get new information, incorporate it in the strategies, right? And improve. Um, I think we uh, have maybe one final question um, and maybe I'll ask you, Tori, to take this one. Uh, how do our different regional offices, we mentioned the 13 offices globally and you now in your new fantastic global role, how would you say these regional offices connect with each other? Yeah, so I think it's important maybe not to sugarcoat the fact that we are a US headquartered firm. So the majority of our employees, the majority of our, our assets are in the States. Um, what that means to me, though, from being a London office employee is actually a really positive part. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is you have one, a much broader role. So I see a much bigger breadth of things that I recruit for here compared to some of my colleagues in the States. There is a lot more opportunity to get good exposure to every different part of the business. Um, and also, you have to interact with the other smaller offices somewhat more because you're not reliant on being HQ. So my view of how our company interacts is, yes, there is a US headquarters. We are London, so we are one of the bigger offices outside of, of that HQ. Um, and then we go on then. So we interact with our German office or our Irish office or our, you know, our Amsterdam office. And it's the same in Asia Pacific. So our Sydney office will be kind of the hub for Asia Pac. But then they interact with Singapore, with Tokyo, with Hong Kong, with Melbourne. And they and fundamentally, actually, in the States, they don't see the same results kind of that we do in that and that we have to be very open to different cultures, to different ways of looking at things and just operating in a really different environment. But what you do have then behind you is this global kind of brand and this big beast of a firm that is there to almost back up your decisions. So you can be nimble in being a smaller office, but also part of this much bigger network that drives forward on your career, basically, and that, that looks better on your CV than being exclusively just in a small kind of UK focused business. Well, that is a fantastic place to land, Tori. Thank you so much. Um, well, we hope that you all have enjoyed getting to know about us at Dimensional and that it was useful. Really appreciate all the questions that you had coming in. If we didn't get to them, um, I'm just putting up here uh, our uh, names and, and titles. Uh, please do get in touch with us on LinkedIn if you have any further questions. Um, but uh, all that's kind of left to do now is, is if you would join me in, in thanking our speakers um, and, uh, you know, please connect with us. Um, just as a, a brief reminder, all of these sessions are recorded and added on the Skills Workshop website after the session. Uh, so you can still register for other upcoming sessions going forward. Um, and we hope that you had a great time with us. Really appreciate it. Take care.